Hey friends, let's jump into our teaching for today. My name is Justin. I'm the vision and teaching pastor here at One Life. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to continue our series called Colossians. And I want to start where Daniel left off last week with this line. You are complete through your union with Christ. Let's just let that settle in for a second. You are complete through your union with Christ. Oh, man, such good news. You, you are complete through your union with Christ. My prayer is that you believe that. That you believe that. If there, if there was a, a thesis statement for the book of Colossians, I have to believe that that would be in the running. That when Paul was mapping out what he wanted to write to this church in Colossae, to this group of Christians, this group of Gentiles who had heard the gospel of Jesus and they had now given their life to the way of Jesus. And as he sat down and he mapped out this letter, I have to believe that this would have been one of his thesis statements. You are complete through your union with Christ. Paul wanted to make sure that this group of Christians, to, to make sure that they knew and they understood and that they believed that nothing more is needed, only Christ. I believe that if Paul was sitting here with you and I, that one of the, the, the number one thing that Paul would want us to really grab a hold of today is that we need nothing else but Christ. When we talk about getting to God or experiencing God or walking out the Christian life, that all we need is Christ. You are complete through your union with Christ. Now as we read the text for today, which is going to be Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, we're not going to cover very much ground, Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, I want us to be asking these three questions. We've been asking them every week as we've been studying the book of Colossians. Number one is, what grabs your attention as we read these verses? What what jumps off the page at you? What makes you scratch your head? What brings up a question for you? What, What makes you lean in? What grabs your attention? And then, what is the good news? What are these Three verses teach you about who God is and how God is operating in the world. What is the good news? And then three, how can you live it out? How can you put it into action? What is the action step that we find as we dig into and study this text for today? So let's read. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes these words. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with Him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away then. God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that that as we open the pages of your word, there, there are words and phrases and promises that leap off the page and they grab a hold of us, that they invite us to lean in and dig a little bit deeper. Thank you that that is true today as we open your word and as we study the book of Colossians. Thank you, God, that your word, your written word, is full of good news. It it teaches us who you are and what you are up to in the world, what you are up to in our lives, what you are up to in our neighborhoods and our families. Thank you, God, that your word moves us to action, that your good news, the gospel, moves us to new life. It moves us to live in the way of Jesus. Thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us open eyes to see what you have for us today, open ears to hear your voice above all the other voices and all the other noises. And we 
pray that you give us open hearts to embrace what you have for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen and amen. So here is the question that Paul begins to wrestle with in this section. The question is this, how does someone come to Christ? How does someone come to Christ? He says it like this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. When you came to Christ. And then back in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Just as you received Christ. How does someone receive Christ? How does someone come to Christ? This was a very normal question during Paul's time. There was another question that was attached to this question that Jesus also received. And it was this, how does somebody inherit eternal life? It would have been one of the first questions that you would have asked a new rabbi or new teacher to see if you wanted to align yourself with their teachings. You would come up to a rabbi, you'd come up to a teacher, you'd come up to a pastor and you'd say, How do I inherit eternal life? And the way that they would answer that question would then prompt you to go and try to find another rabbi or prompt you to follow that rabbi. There's a story. Jesus is teaching and a man comes up and we know that this man was a man who had influence, a man of power. He was a man that was very rich and he comes to Jesus and he starts with this question. Rabbi, teacher, How do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers by listing some of the Ten Commandments. He lists the ideas that this man would have been very familiar with. And Jesus says, well, if you've done all those things, then you're good to go. The only problem was that Jesus invited this man one step further And he says, the rich young ruler, he says, I want you to go and I want you to sell all your possessions and then come follow me. Because for this man, his possessions, the things that he held dear, things that were good, these were idols to him. These were things that he did not want to submit to the lordship of Jesus. And so for Jesus, it was, you're going to have to give up everything in order to, to come and follow me. How does one come to Christ? How do we inherit eternal life? In Colossae, there was a lot of bad teaching floating around. Teaching that said that this group of Gentiles, remember this church was primarily made up of Gentiles. Not completely. There were also some Jewish people who had converted and who had placed their trust in Jesus, but primarily Gentiles. There was teachings that said to these Gentiles who had become Christians that they must be circumcised in order to truly follow Christ. Remember, for Gentiles, they weren't born into the family of God. They weren't born into the law, the Torah, so they wouldn't have been circumcised. And so these are grown men who are giving their lives to Jesus. And then these teachers, these False prophets, these false teachers come in and say to these Gentiles, I know that you've placed your faith in Jesus, but you must also fill in the blank. You must also be circumcised. This wasn't a new idea. It it was, but it was a problem for the church in Colossae because bad theology, bad theology, bad understanding, misunderstandings of who God is and how God operates in the world. That is the definition of theology, the understanding of who God is and how God operates in the world. Bad theology pulls us away from the truth that we are complete in our union with Christ. Bad theology pulls us away from the primary thesis statement of Colossians that we are complete in our union with Christ. So Paul was opening, openly criticizing those who were teaching this bad theology. He was doing this, he was openly criticizing because he was protecting the church in Colossae from being pulled away from a theology focused on Christ. He was openly criticizing these false teachers that were trying to add to the gospel of Jesus. 
Paul uses the language in Colossians chapter 2. Daniel pointed it out last week. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive. And Daniel talked about this phrase last week, and he showed us that this language was very, very common at the time, and it was very well known in the region. It means to be captured and taken away for plunder, to be made a slave. And this week, I actually learned that there was another aspect of this phrase that helps us understand what Paul is doing when he's criticizing this bad theology. N.T. Wright points out that the word for captive is actually very close to the word for synagogue. So in the Greek language, the word for captive and the word synagogue are very, very close. And the synagogue was the place in a city like Colossae where Jewish theology was discussed argued and sent out from. The rabbis would get together and they would argue theology. They would argue these ideas. It was the hub of Jewish thinking. Paul uses some very strong language here when he tells the Christians in Colossae, don't be captured or held captive by the teachings in the synagogue in Colossae. Because some teachings were coming out of the synagogue that said you have to do more in order to be saved by Christ. And so he says, don't be captured or don't be held captive by the bad teachings, the false teachings of the synagogue. This kind of criticism wouldn't have been praised. It wouldn't have been popular If they had Facebook back then, it wouldn't have been a very popular idea to criticize the teachings of the synagogue. In fact, it was this kind of criticism that landed Paul in prison. It was this kind of public criticism that landed Jesus on a cross. It was this kind of criticism that that got Stephen stoned in the book of Acts. It was this kind of criticism that got Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany and Martin Luther King Jr. killed. It was a criticism of false theology, false teachings that pull our eyes away from Christ and that cause us to idolize and worship other things. This type of criticism is necessary. Because Christians, then and now, we are easily drawn into believing that we have to add something to Jesus in order to be saved. We're we're, we're so easily drawn to believe that something else has to be added to Jesus in order to receive everything that Jesus offered. And my friends, that is a lie. It is not true. Nothing is needed but Christ. We face this same temptation today. We face the temptation to believe in human nonsense, to believe in empty philosophies, to believe in self-help lies, to believe in ideologies and, and different sides of the aisle in politics, in individualistic teachings. We are tempted to believe that bad fruit is actually good fruit. And Paul says, Don't be captured by this nonsense, even if it sounds religious, even if it's coming from the hub of religious teaching. Don't be captured by the nonsense because all you need is Christ. You are complete, my friends, through your union with Christ. Now let's go back. Colossians chapter 2, when you came to Christ, You were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. So how does one receive Christ? Paul says it's not through a physical 
circumcision. Instead, it's through a spiritual circumcision. And this spiritual circumcision that Paul is speaking of, he calls it baptism. Baptism is this picture of us being united in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, it's not that baptism saves us. If this were true, then a person could get dunked under the water and not believe in Jesus and be saved. Or the church could use manipulation, coercion, or force people to be baptized and they would be saved. But that's not true. It's not true that someone can get dunked on the water and not have faith and be saved. It's not true that we can manipulate, coerce, and force people to be baptized and then be saved. It's not true. So Paul says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life. These words, because you trusted, or because of your faith in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Because you trusted the mighty power of God, you have been baptized. It's because of faith in the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead that you have been saved, and now you have been baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Baptism in of itself doesn't mean anything. Rather, Our baptism is the wedding ceremony where we say, I trust Jesus. Baptism is the physical ceremony where our union with Christ is put on full display. I wonder, do you remember your story? Your baptism story? I do. I was in sixth grade. I had been having conversations with my pastor and my parents about wanting to place my faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus, and wanting to move forward in baptism. And I was at church camp one summer, and I heard the gospel preached again, and I heard the gospel, and it cut me deep, and I wanted to give my life to Jesus. And so I went forward, and I told my counselor there that I was ready to be baptized. We called my pastor, Paul Martin, called my parents. They came over. We went down to the pool at camp. Paul went down in the pool with me, and he told me, he said, Justin, because of your faith in Jesus, because you have trusted the mighty power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he put me down under the water, and I was buried. My old life was buried under the water. My old life, I put to death my old life by the work of Christ on the cross. My old life was put to death. And when I came up out of that water, I came up a new living human being. I came up united in the resurrection of Christ. My friends, the reason that we are baptized is because we have placed our trust in Jesus. So I wonder today, Have you placed your trust in the mighty work of God that raised Jesus from the dead? Do you believe in Jesus? If you believe in Jesus, there is nothing that needs to be added. And then I would invite you to be baptized. If you would like to do that, we would love to walk with you. Reach out to the church. Email us. Reach out to me. We would love to to walk along on that journey with you as you unite your life in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all of our sins. In baptism, we are made new. Can we go on living however we want after we are baptized? Paul would say, absolutely not. In Colossians, he reminds us that through faith in our baptism, our sinful nature has been cut away and we have been made alive with Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. We have been given new life. 
Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning <clears throat> so that grace may increase? By no means. He goes on, he says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and to, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in his death like this, baptism, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Does this mean we go on sinning? No. No. In fact, here's an interesting thing about the word sin. Most of the time when Paul uses the word sin, it's a noun and not a verb. This means that Paul is speaking of our sinful nature. Who we are as sinners. Our identity as sinners. Not just the act of sinning. Will we sin? Sure. Will we miss the mark? Absolutely. But will we be identified as sinners? No. Because we'll have a new identity. When we are united in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through baptism, because of our faith in Jesus, we have a new identity. We are the bride of Christ. We receive a new name. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are children, sons, and daughters, co-heirs of Christ. Just as when my wife and I were married and we said I do to one another and, and, and people witnessed that ceremony and Nicole took on my name, she became the bride. We are the bride of Christ and we take on the name of Christ. We are given a new life. Now I want to go back to the beginning of this verse, of these verses in Colossians chapter 2. And Paul says, when you came to Christ, or earlier in chapter 2 in verse 6, he says, just as you received Christ. How does one receive Christ? What does it mean? You know, unfortunately, we have Americanized this idea. We have our Americanized understanding of what it means to give our lives to Christ. It might mean that I heard the gospel and then I went down front and I prayed a prayer. Or I was sitting with my mom or my dad or my grandma or grandpa in my bedroom whenever I was six years old and I said a prayer. It might mean for some of us it was a one-time event that happened a long time ago. For some of us it's a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's an idea of getting to go to heaven. And that's what it means when it says, when you came to Christ or just as you received Christ. I remember being asked one time, Justin, would you know where you are going if you died today? I'm sure you've had that conversation at some point. Maybe you've been a part of a team that has asked people on the streets that question. But that question is actually missing the point completely. It's missing the point of what Paul is saying, this idea that salvation or giving our lives to Christ or receiving Christ is a one-time event is missing the point of what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is this. You are, are you ready to take on the full way of Jesus? It's not just about a conversion moment. It's not just about a moment in time. It's not just about saying a prayer. The invitation is to take on the teachings, the ways, the words the works of Jesus, and make them my own. The idea here is complete surrender to the Lordship of Christ. See, what we did is we lowered the bar. 
when we made it about a prayer, when we made it about it a moment, when we made it simply about getting out of hell and going to heaven, we lowered the bar and it's caused us to completely misunderstand what Christ is inviting us to. It's not just about getting out of hell and going to heaven, but instead the bar is set where you surrender your everything to the Lordship of Christ. Good, bad, ugly, all of it. You surrender it to him and you take his way as your way. He says it like this in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Connect yourself to me. If I go left, you go left. If I go right, you go right. If I decide here, you decide there. If I say that you're going to do this, then you say, yes, Lord, that's where we're headed. If he asks you to give up that very good thing in your life, then you say, yes, Lord, I surrender to your lordship. This is what Paul is saying. This is what it means for Paul when he says, have you given your life? to Christ? Have you come to Christ? Have you surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? My friends, will you do that today? Will you surrender your everything? The ups and downs, every decision, every step to the Lordship of Jesus today? Will you trust Him as Lord? Will you trust Him as Savior and Messiah? Will you trust Him as your King? Will you say yes to Him being superior and supreme in your life, in your relationships, in your family, and in your decisions? Will you come to Christ today? Let's pray. Abba Father, thank You for loving us so much that you did not stay at a distance, you didn't leave us out on our our own, you didn't give us more laws to follow in order for us to get to you because you knew that we would fail, but instead, in your love, you came to us. And you nailed our sins to the cross, and in exchange, you gave us forgiveness, in exchange, you gave us new names, in exchange, you invited us to sit at your table, You, you, you called us sons and daughters. Abba, Father, I pray that you would do a work in each one of our hearts and show us the places in our lives where we have not surrendered ourselves to the lordship of your son, Jesus. And we trust that it will be your kindness that moves us to repentance and that by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, we will be transformed in the likeness of your son each and every day. We surrender to you and you alone. In the name of the resurrected Christ that we pray, amen and amen. We're going to sing together, and then after we sing, I want to invite you to take communion with those that you're sitting with to spend some time proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus until he returns. Let's worship together, my friends. Grace and peace. Family Life, we're so glad that you're with us today. It's going to be a great time. I'm going to have fun. I know Mo's going to have fun, right? <laughs> Here we go.